Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, CFA colloquium. And uh, the speaker this afternoon is Robin Wordsworth, uh, who is uh, an assistant professor over at CIS and EPS, and hopefully one of many future interdepartmental speakers here at the CFA colloquium. Uh, so Robin did his uh, PhD in Oxford, followed by postdoctoral work in Paris and Chicago, before joining the CSN uh, EPS faculty in 2015. And today he will talk about uh, how, a better uh, how we can achieve a better understanding of Mars's climate and how that can inform also our understanding of exoplanets. So Robin, please. Okay, thanks Karen for the introduction and thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak here. I feel like I know many of you here at the CFA by this point, but certainly not everyone. And it's been great to have the opportunity to, to meet and chat with more of you this afternoon and um, also to talk about the, the uh, work that we've been doing here. So I'm a planetary scientist. I study planetary climate and um, we work a lot on the solar system, but I think one of the themes of what we do is to, to try to come up with ideas that, that generalize to a wider context. And so arguably in planetary science today, one of the central problems or opportunities, if you like, is that we have, um, if you take a systems view, we have one data set with only a few objects, but a, a large number of very detailed observations. That's the solar system. And then another data set with many, many more objects, but um, much poor, uh, coarser observations, which is, of course, exoplanets. And so this talk is really about one way we can go about trying to bridge that gap, and that is by accepting in the solar system that the planets are dynamic and evolve to a large extent with time. We can use both present-day information and information from paleoclimate and have that as a kind of starting point to, to generalize and understand how things should work in a much wider context, including for exoplanets. So um, before I go any further, I want to start by acknowledging a few people and organizations. Um, first off, my group members, past and present, they're doing a really diverse range of things, and I won't be able to do justice to all of them here, but I'm going to call out specifics later on, particularly in like, the final five minutes or so of the talk. Uh, secondly, my, my collaborators. So planetary science is a really interdisciplinary field, and um, the, the collaborations and conversations I've had with these people have really been important for, for what I'm talking about, all the way from field geology to, to quantum spectroscopy. And um, the final thing I'd like to acknowledge is, is our funding sources. OK, so um, talk outline. I want to begin by discussing the climate ev evolution of Mars. Um, it's something I'll be kind of presenting as a case study. And I want to start with the observational background. Um, I'll then go on to talk about the modeling work we've tried to, we've done to, to try to understand the early Martian climate, both um, uh, radio transfer modeling and, and three-dimensional climate studies. And then I want to take some time to discuss our ongoing and future work because the present day is a pretty exciting time for, for Mars studies. There's a number of upcoming NASA missions that we're, that we're really excited about. So that's going to be kind of the first two-thirds of the talk. And then from there, I want to discuss how we generalize from the solar system to exoplanets. And I'm going to be doing this in one particular context, and that's of this question of planetary redox evolution, planetary oxidation. And um, I'll talk about how this links to, to biosignatures, how we have um, specific ways to detect life on other worlds. Um, and so, so I, I will talk about the generalization in that context. And then at the very end, I think this laser point is dying, um, I'll discuss just a couple of other examples. Okay, so first, the climate evolution of Mars. Well, actually, before I talk about the climate evolution of Mars, I want to say just a few words about the evolution of Mars climate research, because this is something which has really changed significantly over time. I think it's fair to say Mars has always captured human imagination. Um, and in the late 19th and 20th century, Mars was assumed to be um, Earth-like in many ways. So most famously, there are the observations by Percival Lovell and, and others of canals on the surface, and Honestly, even at the time, these were, were a subject of a lot of skepticism. But it's fair to say that even as late as the, night, uh, the 1950s, just before the dawn of the space age, it was widely accepted that we expect there should be life on Mars. And so the, the idea wasn't um, thought to be particularly controversial to, to most scientists. 
So then in the 60s, you have the first flybys of Mars, and the initial studies, I would say, were, were disappointing to many because they showed a crater-marked surface, which um, looked much more like the moon than anything that we would expect on Earth. So there was this kind of initial disappointment, but that itself shifted as well a little bit later because once more detailed geomorphology was started to be possible on the surface, it became apparent that although present-day Mars is extremely cold and dry, there's lots and lots of evidence for past flowing water on the surface. Most famously, these, these dendritic or branching valley networks, which I'll have a bunch more to say about in just a moment. So the 1970s was important because it also witnessed the birth of what we now refer to as the faint young sun problem. And I think this was first clearly described by, by Carl Sagan. Um, so um, the, the faint young sun problem is, is the, the, ish, the challenge of, of warming early Mars. And Sagan, when he, when he first talked about it, came up simultaneously with a number of possible solutions. It's kind of one of the nice things about being first on an idea is you can speculate on a bunch of different things and not really worry about doing the calculations too accurately. And so this plot is very much schematic. But you're looking at time on the x-axis and surface temperature on the, um, on the y-axis. Um, is that a pointer over there? So he has a number of different solutions plotted here, one of them CO2 and H2O. And there's also this initial one bar hydrogen atmosphere. And so on the face of it, this is kind of a crazy idea and because the Mars is so small that you would expect one bar of hydrogen to, to be lost incredibly quickly. But there is a, a kernel of a really interesting concept in here. And so that's something that I'm going to be returning to later in the talk. So let's skip now on to the modern era. And um, I think the most accurate way to put it is that there's now overwhelming evidence that abundant liquid water once flowed over the Martian surface. So the plot up here, we have the, the topography of Mars, present day topography, and then the plot here is showing the relative ages of this topography. So as always in planetary science, if we have a more crater marked surface, it's going to be older. And by using a crater counting model, we can estimate ages. So broadly speaking, most of Mar a lot of Mars' southern terrain is of this Noachian era, the oldest period of Mars, which is approximately three to four billion years ago. And it's the region where we have the most concentrated evidence for alteration by liquid water. So what is this evidence? I've got a uh, few of the sort of greatest hits up here. Um, the, I think most famous of all is the, um, the valley networks, which I mentioned previously. These are spreads across wide regions of the, of the southern terrain. Uh, there's also things like deltaic fan deposits. So what you're looking at here is the interior of a crater where there's been sediment flowing in and then it's, um, it's been deposited and um, it happens that once it's formed, it's, it's more durable than the, the terrain around it. So there's later erosion by wind and things like that. And that leaves it in relief compared to the surrounding terrain. Uh, there's also features like this one. This was observed in situ by the Curiosity rover and this is conglomerates. So what you're looking at is uh, rock particles, clasts, which have been um, flowing, in a, flowing in a river or in a stream. And based on their morphology and their degree of erosion, you can, ge geomorphologists can calculate things like uh, the, the, the rate of flow um, when they were forming. So that gives this in situ evidence is a really important complement. And then the final thing here is not something that typically makes it into um, standard summaries of the evidence for liquid water on Mars, but I, I think it's also important. This is features from the very far south of Mars, um, down in this region called Dorsa Argentia. Um, and these, we think, are eskers. So eskers are features that you see forming at the, the bottom of glaciers on Earth. And you may think, well, glacial features doesn't really sound like evidence of water, but actually Mars today is so cold that all of the ice deposits are, are frozen all the way to their bases. And so in order to have wet-based glaciers to form these kind of features, you needs warmer conditions at the poles of Mars as, as, as well as elsewhere. So it's also evidence of, of climatic alteration. So the geomorphic evidence is really important, um, but it's been supplemented over the last decade by the, the geochemistry. And this has been significant because I would say it's, it's, it's shifted our, our perspective of what was happening on early Mars. Um, so um, there's, there's a few main classes of minerals that are observed. Um, 
One is phyllosilicates, which is, which is a mineralogist term for clays, essentially. Clays require liquid water to form, and we see them across the Martian surface. But actually, more recent detailed analysis have shown that most of these clays probably formed in the subsurface, and maybe very, very soon after Mars formed in a steam atmosphere event. So they are not particularly indicative of, of long-term warm and wet conditions. There's also regional weathering sequences observed, um, but these are dotted across the surface, and, and studies that estimate their, their formation times come up with numbers consistently, which are much, much smaller than the total duration of this Noachian period, which is about a billion years or so. Um, and then the final thing is, that, um, is the story of carbonates. So um, if car carbonate is a mineral that will form if you have basaltic crust, CO2 in the atmosphere, and liquid water on the surface, which is um, things which were all present on, on Mars for in, in, in portions of time, but they require time to form. And what's interesting on Mars is we actually don't see many evidence, much evidence for carbonates. There's a little bit of it in Martian dust, and it's in some scattered regions on the surface, but far, far less, again, than one would expect if you have the whole surface over the entire time period being warm and wet. So um, I'm going to get on to talk about the, the theory about this in um, just a moment. But before we do that, I want this to, to present this sort of takeaway slide from the, the the geology to inform us about what timescales we need for modeling. So as I mentioned, the approximate total dura duration of this early period where Mars is warm and wet is about one billion years. There's landform evolution studies that have shown the time required to carve the largest valley networks, and that's about 0.1 to 10 million years. For these weathering sequences, it's under 3 million years, depending on temperature. Um, in some recent work that um, is, is still under review, we've shown that you can estimate the salinity of Gale Crater Lake, and you can come up with a time scale for the formation of Gale Crater, this location where the Mars rover is currently, and that's about under one million year. So these are sort of broadly consistent, and the overall conclusion is that to explain the geologic evidence, what we need is intermittent warm and wet surface conditions from about 0.01 to 1% of early Martian history. Okay, so, so how do we achieve that? And, and why is it a problem? In order to think about this, I think it's nice to go back to very basic climate calculations. And equilibrium temperature is about as basic as you can get. So just energy in equals energy out. This is the same as the standard one you get in Earth science textbooks, except now we have a term for the faintness of the young sun and a term for Mars's orbital distance. Um, this is nice talking to an astrophysics audience, because I don't need to belabor the standard solar model. but. We think that the solar luminosity for three to four billion years ago should have been about um, 70 to 80 percent of present day. Um, there's an unknown here, which is the Martian albedo, but let's make things really simple and just set that to zero and assume that early Mars absorbed every single photon that the sun was sending to it. So then we can put the numbers into that, and we come up with a equilibrium temperature of 210 Kelvin, which for context is approximately the same value as Antarctic winter today on Earth. So clearly not something you'd associate with the presence of liquid water. So we have observations, we have a model, and the model's made an incorrect prediction. What, what's the things in this model which are, which are wrong or missing? We can start with the, the really, lar the really um, basic things. So what about that D, the Martian semi-major axis? I think the short answer to this is it's extremely unlikely. Um, the protoplanetary disk was cleared um, much, much earlier, the origin of the solar system, and these features are forming around 3.8 billion years ago. There's just no way in dynamical models to, to make such large-scale migration of Mars work. Solar luminosity is a little bit more interesting, and there are non-standard solar models, usually involving mass loss, that um, m allow you to have um, different solar luminosities. Um, there's also slightly more extreme things like variations in the gravitational constant, which we've actually looked at, but um, focusing just on, on um, mass loss models here. It's interesting and possibly could play in a sort of five plus or minus 5% level into things, but on its own, it cannot be the sole solution. And the reason for this is that if you make the young sun bright enough that it um, warms early Mars on its own, then eventually you're going to get to a point where early Earth is in a runaway greenhouse state and we lose all of our oceans. So that's 
very, very clearly inconsistent with observations. Um, and even if you use present-day solar, solar luminosity, which is just a little bit below that, in the equilibrium temperature calculation, you get 226 Kelvin. So what about other heat sources? And here it kind of becomes like a maybe. There's things like meteorite impacts, volcanism, and geothermal heat flux, and they all could have contributed in various ways. But important pieces of the, of the geologic evidence require, as I, as I just stated, longer warming episodes. So the big thing that then leaves is the atmospheric greenhouse effect. And that's obviously not incorporated in an equilibrium temperature calculation, and that's what I want to focus on from here. So people have thought about this before, and I think um, it, it said briefly, warming early Mars is the atmospheric greenhouse effect. It's not easy either. Um, Mars's atmosphere today is dominated by CO2, so a thicker CO2 atmosphere in the past seems natural. It turns out that this alone is not sufficient either because of the combination of enhanced Rayleigh scattering, CO2 is very good at Rayleigh scattering, and CO2 condensation. Eventually you get to the stage where the atmosphere just rains out on the surface. Um, people have looked in the past at CO2 cloud infrared scattering effects. It's kind of complicated and works quite nicely if you assume 100% cloud coverage, but if you do a more realistic simulation and you get patchy clouds, then it falls very far short of what's required. Uh, people have looked at SO2 from volcanism, um, and this is kind of interesting. SO2 is a moderately effective greenhouse gas, but it's short-lived in um, the present day or past Martian atmosphere, and the reason is that even if there's even very trace amounts of H2O present, it converts into sulfate aerosols very rapidly, and these cool once they form. We have observational evidence of this on Earth from the Pinatubo eruption that happened in the early 1990s. And so the maximum you get is sort of sub six month time scales of warming of about 10 Kelvin or so. So it's not a very good candidate either. Finally, there's steam atmospheres from meteorite impacts. Um, and this is in a similar kind of framework. You get short bursts of warming that um, are intense, but can't explain things that require up to a million or several million years to form. So in order to think about this more, we need to go back to thinking about what makes a good greenhouse gas. Um, and so what I'm showing here is a plot of, um, in the thermal infrared, going from zero to 2,500 wave number, the absorption of various gases. Um, and you can see there's the familiar CO250 micron band. H2O does broad absorption over a wide region, but of course it's coupled to the rest of the climate system. It's not an independent greenhouse gas. Um, SO2 is in green here. You can see how it's a, why it's a reasonable greenhouse gas, but not that effective because it's just in small bands. But if you look at the outgoing long wave radiation, this is the thermal radiation leaving the Martian atmosphere. This plot gives us a strong clue about what regions would have to be absorbed in in order for warming to be effective, because you have strong emission occurring here and here um, in this region where, where CO2 does not absorb very much. And so an effective Martian greenhouse gas has to reduce this outgoing radiation in these portions. So you can look through the Hydran database, for example, and see many, many different gases and, and compare their different effects. And it's hard to find species that are chemically plausible and absorbed there in just terms of single molecule interaction with, the, uh, with, with, with thermal photons. But um, you can go further than that, because actually in, in um, thinking about greenhouse effects, you're not just limited to standard single molecule excitations. because Collision-induced absorption can also be significant. Uh, the excellent observed example of that is the atmosphere of Titan, where you have species like N2 and H2 and CH4 combining to give you additional absorption effects. Uh, we showed a few years ago that um, hydrogen and nitrogen, CIA, could have been a very powerful warming agent on the early Earth. Um, and I, I won't get into the, the debate, the ongoing debate about um, atmospheric composition of the early Earth, um, because it's, there's still a lot of uncertainties, but it um, looks like hydrogen is still is now necessary to explain the, the xenon isotopic signature, at least. So, so given that we, we know on Titan and on terrestrial planets that um, hydrogen in combination with gases like nitrogen could have caused intense warming, what about reducing atmospheres on early Mars? So this idea was actually picked up a year after we, we published the early Earth work. Um, and this 
exact concept. If you take a CO2 as a background gas, and then they went through the numbers and found if you get 5 to 20% of H2 in the atmosphere, maybe that could give you um, a warm and wet state. Um, and so um, this requires very, very high continuous volcanic outgassing, and so isn't really that plausible. But as a, as a mechanism, it's still very interesting. So um, another thing that gets raised a lot is methane. Um, in fact, I have this experience regularly at conferences where I talk to geomorphologists, and they say, ah, oh, what are you climate people doing? You should think about methane. Methane's the strong greenhouse gas on Earth. Greenhouse gas on Earth. This must be the solution. Um, and this actually is a good example of how, when you're thinking about different climates, you really need to do calculations, because it turns out methane on its own is not an effective Martian greenhouse gas. The reasons for this are a little bit subtle, but basically, on early Mars, if you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, the main band where methane absorbs gets blocked by CO2. It also absorbs strongly in the near infrared, so you end up getting temperature inversions and an anti-greenhouse effect. However, there is an important caveat to this, because the CIA greenhouse effect of H2 and CH4 in a CO2-dominated atmosphere um, actually hadn't been calculated before, because the Ramirez et al. study assumed nitrogen as the background gas for their calculations. And when we were thinking about this, we realized this um, um, could be important. And this is actually partly in conversation with Oli Gordon, who may or may not be in the audience. Um, it turns out that um, CO is a more effective interactant than, than N2. And the reason is that you, um, for collision-induced absorption to cause a strong effect, um, you it's a first order. It's usually the electric quadrupole moment that is interacting to, to cause a strong dipole moment in the other molecule. Um, and so because CO2 is, is not um, homonuclear and diatomic, it has a more uneven charge distribution than N2. And so the result of this is that even if you just go and look at the experimental papers directly, the um, quadrupole moment of um, CO2 is significantly uh, larger than that of nitrogen. And because the strength of the large part of CIA is proportional roughly to the square of the electric quadrupole moment, um, you, just by back of the envelope thinking, you should expect that CO2 CIA is about five to ten times stronger than that of nitrogen. So we looked at this uh, in, in detail using a combination of um, ab initio calculations and um, going on to uh, do a semi-empirical estimates of the actual absorption spectra for the CIA. Um, so this was a, the work done by my, my um, spectros spectroscopist collaborators. And then we combine this with a line-by-line -line radiative convective modeling part, where we put these coefficients just in 1D into a planetary atmosphere, um, and then figured out the warming effect that they should have. So the plots here are showing um, as a function of the amount of reducing gases in the atmosphere, the global mean surface temperature that comes out. And so again, this is just like horizontally averaged atmosphere, um, not worrying about cloud effects and things like that. But the dot dashed lines show the calculations with the old coefficients, and the solid lines show the calculations with the new ones. And you can see that it has a really significant effect. So you can, um, with um, the revised coefficients, go to uh, pressures of about 1 to 1.5 bar, and for a few percent of hydrogen or methane or some combination of these gases in the atmosphere, um, you get close to melting point of liquid water on the Martian surface. Um, and I should add that the experimental work um, to, to validate these coefficients is ongoing. The, the preliminary studies that are out right now are broadly compatible with this. They, they look um, a little bit different in the details, but the, the, broadly speaking, it looks like it's a, giving the same kind of effect as the theory. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the direct implications of this for exoplanet habitability, but, but they, they are there. And for those of us who like to calculate habitable zones, you can go away and use these gases in the planetary atmosphere and see how they modify the habitable zone and get different results from if you were just doing pure CO2 atmosphere, for example. So this is, this is interesting, but um, you may note that Mars today does not have a few percent of hydrogen or methane in its atmosphere. So 
this is a quite radically different scenario from, from the present day atmosphere. So you may be thinking, this is great, but how, how plausible is it that these conditions actually existed? So when thinking about this, it's, it's fun to do a little bit of comparative planetology and um, in particular move to the outer solar system where there's, I always think Titan is, is such, a, such a strange case that if it didn't exist, we'd never be able to imagine it. But Titan, Titan is, a, is a real example of a, of a body with a thick nitrogen atmosphere and percent levels of hydrogen and methane in its atmosphere. Um, the methane is out of equilibrium, so if you look at the rate at which it's being photolyzed, it should last about 10 million years, which implies there's a source region from deeper. One of the things that's been proposed for this is that there's classeration of methane on Titan and through episodic processes, which are still not that well understood, you should get outgassing of methane and hence replenishment over, over long time scales. So, um, this is interesting in the context of Mars because Mars today, we're kind of used to thinking of as hyperoxidized. Um, and um, indeed, it's, it's it, the very top layer of its surface is, but it, you do, in some cases literally have to drill only skin deep to, to see evidence of much more reducing conditions. And so this is an example of a drill core from the Curiosity rover, which is showing oxidized, um, uh, like oxidized iron in, in the dust on the outside, and then um, more reducing material just inside. And there's also evidence from the Martian meteorites that the Martian mantle is significantly more reducing than that of Earth's. It's, um, for the Earth's is near this quartz phalite magnetite buffer, and Mars is, is, is um, several log units below that. And actually, people have even proposed uh, methane classification on, on early Mars as an uh, important mechanism previously as well, but not in the context of, of uh, planetary climate previously. So we've kind of been playing with a um, simple conceptual model of how uh, a mechanism for episodic release of these gases would work. Um, so the basic idea is that you have um, either from volcanism or crustal aqueous alteration emission of um, H2 into the atmosphere and also potentially formation of methane through Similar kind of processes as is as observed on Earth with, um, so this is an uh, image of a study doing field work on, on basaltic deposits on Earth that are showing evidence of uh, methane emissions. And so based on, based on these terrestrial constraints, we can do scaling to estimate approximately how much could be released. Um, and you can then do the upper atmospheric portion of the problem and look at rates of hydrogen loss to space and methane photodestruction. Um, and if you get the atmosphere to a point where there's enough of these gases to cause warming, then the residence time from there is of order a quarter of a million years or so. And so the, the, the thinking here is that if you have these events ongoing in an episodic kind of way, then um, when you have... A, a, a few tens of them, that may be sufficient to cause enough warming to see the surface melting that we see. So um, this is, I haven't really focused on the, on the 3D modeling part of this, but I want to mention this very briefly. We've also looked at the way that the um, water cycle evolves on the Martian surface. And um, you can demonstrate, in fact, that under a thicker CO2 atmosphere, um, you have a cool, a, what's known as an abiotic cooling effect. So um, the same effect as causes mountain peaks on, on Earth today to be cooler than lower lying regions, we think should lead to migration of ice across the Martian surface. And it turns out that a lot of the valley networks are observed over the um, southern equatorial highlands. And um, over long time scales in a, in a cold climate state, this leads to migration of ice sources towards um, where we would need them to be on the Martian surface when one of these transient warming effects happens to, uh, to, to cause erosion of the surface. So um, what we're moving towards with, with this, this Martian modeling is a kind of integrated modeling, an integrated view that allows us to, to combine all of these aspects of the system. And so, um, I think 
any successful model of early Mars has to produce as a minimum warming episodes of integrated duration that are sufficient to explain the, the features that we're seeing. They have to get the spatial locations of the, the fluvial features, the erosive features, correct. Um, then there is a geochemical point, which I want to kind of skip over here, but they have, there has to be a correct description of the way the geochemistry evolves from more reducing conditions to more oxidizing ones. Um, and of course, the, the, you, you have to have enough CO2 in the early atmosphere to, to um, maintain that. And so what we're moving towards at the moment is stochastic modeling of early Mars, where you have these pulses of reducing gases going into the atmosphere, but you have loss of hydrogen to space over time. And um, as a result, you start off with quite reducing conditions, but over time, the planet gradually gets more oxidizing until you transition to present day conditions. And even in a simple model like this, it produces total warm periods that are a small fraction of the, the time of integration, but add up to something which is uh, similar to what's required from the, uh, from the surface features. I should add as well, I probably should have said this at the beginning, but please interrupt me if you have questions or if there's planetary terminology I'm using that, that is unclear or, or anything like that. No? Okay. So, um, ongoing work that um, we, are, we are doing to think about um, the evolution of Mars. Um, is most tightly coupled with what's happening um, in terms of um, future, future NASA missions. So one thing I'm really excited about is um, hydrologic, subsurface hydrology modeling we're doing of, of um, Mars in this Nalakian epoch. And so um, the, um, the idea here is that you, you have results from a climate model that tell you precipitation patterns and um, other temperature diagnostics and so on, and then you input this to a subsurface model which, which tracks the flow of water. And at Gale Crater, because of the Mars Curiosity rover, we now have an extensive suite of data that tells us about um, the changes in mineralogy of the surface through time. And so the idea here is that we, by doing hydrologic modeling, we can constrain the times required to, to form Gale Crater and the uh, types of mineralogy that we should see. So this is still ongoing work done by my grad student, Mark Baum, but um, we're doing this in collaboration with, with um, 2020, um, sorry, Mars uh, Curiosity team members. And, and we're hopeful this is gonna be, allow us to provide new constraints on, the, uh, on the, the conditions that were occurring at this location at Gale, where we think there was once an ancient lake. So looking a little further ahead as well, the, there's also the, um, Mars 2020 rover, so we've been helping out with um, site selection for the, uh, the, the, the landing site for, the, for this rover, which is now, this process is now finished. They've uh, chosen Jezero Crater as a location. And so Jezero is a great example of one of these um, fluvial fans where you've got sediment that's been transported into a, little, into a crater and then deposited. And um, we're extremely interested to apply the same kind of tools as we've been developing for, um, for Gale to, to Jezero as well. And so this will be more in predictive mode so that hopefully we can, we can make statements that can be tested by the, the rover once it arrives. Okay, I seem to be doing quite well for time. So um, this is good because I, if there's no questions on Mars, what I'm transition now a little bit to talking about, um, about exoplanets. So um, this kind of the, the theme of the talk was how we go from the solar system to a wider context. And there's many, many ways in which you could approach this. So I, I don't want to attempt to do it in a comprehensive way here. But what I want to do is take the, the case study that we've been looking at for Mars and see how we can we can generalize this, and I'm gonna do it specifically in the context of the change in chemistry. So this, the, this idea for Mars that you have a transition from more reducing hydrogen-rich conditions to more oxidizing conditions of the time. How, how can we expand this thinking, first of all, to the solar system, and then more broadly to, to planets also around other stars? So I've 
hopefully managed to convince you that the, the um, chemistry of Mars has varied really significantly through time. Um, we can, first of all, go to the solar system, other objects in the solar system, and, and look at um, the chemical conditions in, in the atmosphere and in the interior. Um, so Earth, we always think of as a kind of canonical exa example of a planet that's oxidized, because we have an oxygen-rich atmosphere. And this is true to an extent, but actually if you look at the, the mantle of Earth, um, it's at a kind of intermediate level of oxidation. Mars's mantle appears to be more reduced. Um, Venus has an atmosphere which is, is fairly oxidized. It doesn't have free oxygen like Earth does, but um, the, the chemical calculations, in, so in this work in particular, indicate that its surface is, is more highly oxidizing than that of Earth's. Um, and given that Venus has been completely resurfaced over the last 500 million years, and hydrogen loss has been quite low since then, um, it may well be that its interior is highly oxidized as well. And to me, this is very consistent with the idea that Venus started off with maybe an ocean worth of water and lost that, the hydrogen to space along with some of the oxygen, but then the rest got captured into its, its crust and its mantle. So, um, yeah, that's Venus. Titan has a reducing atmosphere and an unknown interior composition, but likely reducing as well. So... I would argue, and um, we definitely need more solar system data, but I think based on what we, we have, we can argue that there's a trend as you move outwards in the solar system to more reducing conditions. But of course, there's also a trend towards lower masses because um, of just what, the, the distribution that we've been given. And so I think one can pose the question, what drives these bold trends? And in particular, what is the role of orbital distance versus, versus planetary mass in, in, in driving this evolution? I want to stress this point because I think this is the, uh, redox chemistry is really fundamental to, to, to a number of things, but particularly habitability, and it gets less emphasized sometimes than it should be. Um, we've already shown that hydrogen rich or methane rich atmospheres can provide greenhouse warming. Um, there's a sort of origin of life aspect to this because prebiotic chemistry requires moderately to strongly reducing conditions. Um, and conversely, if you have a highly oxidizing scenario with oxidants like O2 or hydrogen peroxide, then complex organic molecules will be rapidly destroyed. Um, so reducing conditions early on and then some kind of intermediate between reducing and oxidizing is most favorable for life. And then there's an additional problem or uh, thing, to, thing to be interested in because highly oxidized atmospheres likely present... Um, will present false positives for life. We're used to thinking of, we know that oxygen on Earth is the, the life on Earth is the, is the proximal cause of our oxygen atmosphere. But there are ways in which you can produce oxygen-dominated atmospheres which have nothing to do with life. So we proposed one of these in 2014, which is that you take an otherwise completely Earth-like planet and you reduce the amount of nitrogen in its atmosphere. Eventually, the H2O gets to the high atmosphere. It gets broken up by UV photons. Hydrogen escapes to space and oxygen can build up. And then and in an important paper the year after that, it was shown that for M stars in particular, if it's because you have this long pre-main sequence phase, you can have an extended period of water loss where um, that, um, that effect can also occur and can, can potentially be very significant and, and lead to atmospheres. They predict in this paper up to, to hundreds to thousands of bars of oxygen. So this is um, a number of important reasons to care about um, oxidation in, in, in an exoplanet context. So we started thinking about how we can address this in a, in a sort of generalized framework. And um, the, there's no getting around the fact that it's complicated because what you need to do is have an evolution model of the atmosphere which couples with the planet's interior, its mantle and possibly also its core. And um, that involves a number of different modeling components. So you need to think about stellar evolution. You have to think about atmospheric escape. And then there's a, there's a uh, lower atmospheric portion where there's chemistry and rate of transfer. And then I think most importantly, you also have to couple to the planet's interior. So there's um, either a magma ocean or a solid mantle, depending on which state it's in. So in theory, you're going to end up with a very, very complicated model because it's coupling all of these different processes. So we do that, and it's got this um, kind of box model framework here. 
But in order to, to scale back this complexity a little bit and make things tractable, there's one big simplification that we make, and that's to reduce the number of active chemical species. We assume that only hydrogen, oxygen, and iron are um, allowed to do chemistry in this system. And the motivation for that is that just by um, uh, galactic abundance arguments, they're the most dominant redox active species. Iron tends to reduce, it's heavy, so it tends to sink to the core. Hydrogen tends to reduce and is light, so it tends to, uh, it escapes to space. And oxygen is abundant, so actually just the default um, outcome of that should be that the terrestrial planet atmospheres should always oxidize to a greater or lesser extent. So it's a kind of basic physical process, we think, that emerges from the, the galactic abundances that we have. But the real uh, details in the model come from estimating what these exchanges are as a function of time. So the, uh, these exchange coefficients and then this escape term here, which is, in this diagram is downwards because N is oxidizing power. So net escape of hydrogen atoms corresponds to supply of oxidizing, oxidizing power to the atmosphere. So I, this is kind of a talk where I, I mentioned a few different things. And um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through each one of these components in detail here. I do have them as backup slides. So if people are interested, I'll definitely talk about them a lot in a lot more detail. Um, there is one I want to say more about in particular, which is the magma ocean part, because a lot of this stuff is kind of done with um, for evolution modeling, um, but the coupling to the interior in the atmosphere is, is a step forward we took, which, which had not been done previously. And so I want to say a few words about that here. Um, for, the, for the results that I'm showing you here, we're focused on the early evolution of planets. Early evolution means the planets start hot, and so they, they initialize in the magma ocean phase. Um, Magma ocean means that you're going to have rapid mixing between the atmosphere and the, the, the interior. So in some senses, it's actually easier to model than, say, Earth's present day state, where we have plate tectonics and mixing time scales that are much slower. But so in a magma ocean event, as the planet cools, what's happening is you have a solidification region and then uh, a kind of mush that moves upwards until the whole thing freezes. So you have this decreasing volume of liquid, which is in good contact with the atmosphere. You have loss of hydrogen and oxygen to space by um, just XUV-driven escape. And then you need to take into account the surface, you need to know the surface temperature, so you take into account the greenhouse warming of the atmosphere, which we do using a line-by-line -line approach. And then um, it's also necessary to track where the oxygen is going in your model and um, to model the equilibration of, of greenhouse gases. So I have H2O and CO2 here. We did include CO2 in some of the calculations, but it actually has a fairly minor role because um, for standards, solar system abundances, we expect H2O to be, to be uh, uh, more, much more abundant. And this plot here is just showing how we parameterize the mole fraction of the magma ocean based on, um, based on the um, more detailed models of, of these processes. And so there, there's, there's a few things that go into this. These, this. Some of this data comes from, from lab experiments. There's lab work done on this mel fraction as well. So there are definitely constraints on this stuff. But um, there are, um, it, we don't have yet direct observations of magma ocean planets. So this is, this is um, important to study sensitivity parameters when we're doing this kind of thing as well. Um, Let's just focus on this to begin with. So um, I, this is the model results. I want to begin by showing you the uncoupled model results, starting with just the atmosphere only case. And so the bars you're looking at here are for a few solar system planets and then a few um, representative exoplanets. Um, there's some others where we did the Trappist planets, but it looks kind of similar. Um, I want you to focus on the, the darkest colors here because the light colors are doing a sensitivity analysis that we think is making quite extreme assumptions. So it's the, the, the darker ones are more the more reasonable range. And in red, we have oxidizing power in units of terrestrial oceans of, um, well, the, sorry, the blue is the oxidizing power through hydrogen loss. The red is the total reducing power of the mantle. And I think the main point that this plot makes is that the reducing power of the mantle is order of magnitude larger than how much you can oxidize by losing hydrogen to space. So this emphasizes why it's so important to couple the interior to the atmosphere when you're doing these kind of calculations. 
Um, in the paper associated with this, we have a lot of plots with different um, parameters to do sensitivity studies, but I want to highlight the one with the, the uh, canonical parameters here. So on the, in this contour plot, we have on the x-axis the iron content of the mantle. On the y-axis, it's the quantity of H2O in the total system, so, so um, interior plus atmosphere. Um, and then the color is the buildup of atmospheric oxygen just after the end of the, uh, the, the planet's mag motion phase. And so what this shows, or the red line shows an analytic limit we calculated just to check we understood what the model was doing. And this limit is when you pass to a point where there's no oxygen left in the planet's atmosphere. And what this is showing is that for um, once you get to the point where you have a high H2O content or a high mantle iron content, you no longer build up atmospheric oxygen at all. And well, I think this, the dependence on iron is quite easy to understand. If there's more reducing power available, you get less oxygen. The dependence on water is a little more subtle, and that comes from the fact that with more water, you get more of a one runaway greenhouse, which gives you um, more, uh, you get a deeper magma ocean because it's hotter, and that gives you a larger volume to, uh, for, for the interaction to occur with. So um, we think both these effects are likely to be quite robust. There's one extra dependence, which is even more robust, and that um, came out very, very clearly from the models, and that is that all of this depends strongly on the planet's orbital distance. So um, regardless of what assumptions you make, more or less, you know, this is a uh, semi-major axis on this scale, and um, the atmospheric O2 content on this one. As you go to greater distances, you see less much less oxygen in the final stage in the atmosphere. And um, the reason for this is that um, you have a shorter magma ocean phase. Um, and because you're further away, you have less XUV photons. So you have less total loss of water as well. Um, um, we also did a kind of executive summary for a few exoplanets. I produced this plot last year, and it's already out of date because of tests. But there you go. Uh, it, the, the, this shows for. Um, the Trappist planets and a couple of the recently discovered Mirth planets, the, our best estimate of how much oxygen is built up um, in the planet's atmosphere. And so um, it, we, we actually studied this one in a um, 2016 paper, which was led by Laura Schaefer a, a, year, a few years before. And this is interesting, in particular, this planet, because it's, it's too hot to have um, life, but we predict that there's a range of circumstances where it may have abiotic O2, and so this is a test for the models. Which uh, these, these are models that a lot of parameters go into, but we, there are planets that are outside the habitable zone, which are, we can make predictions for, and so it's going to be a way of validating our models before we get to the regime where we're directly trying to say whether oxygen could be used as a biosignature or not. So I'm definitely excited about the potentially habitable cases, but I'm also really excited about the uh, the closer in hotter ones as well. Uh, yeah, and um, I think everyone here knows that these predictions are testable in future. Um, so, 453, oh, this is kind of a caveat slide. Kind of important to talk about, so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it briefly. There's, there's one thing which I haven't modeled here and which we're still thinking about, and that is loss of nitrogen for, from, from Earth-like planets. It's likely to be a severe problem in the, uh, around M stars because of the, the fact that M stars are so active. Um, it's a way for you to lose water and potentially build up oxygen atmospheres, even when you're outside of this magma ocean phase where you have the potential to soak up lots and lots of oxygen. And this plot is just showing as a function of time, the um, escape oxidation rate you would get around a typical M star, various versus various limits for uptake of oxygen into um, the planet's interior. And so it's just making the point that this process will be important across a large part of the system's lifetime. Um, and so we're still thinking about this. And I, I think further modeling will help. But it also may ultimately become important to think about how we can constrain nitrogen inventories on, on exoplanets. It's a hard thing to do because nitrogen is such a spectroscopically inactive gas, but there have been some attempts to model this using nitrogen, nitrogen CIA in, uh, in the sort of near-infrared type of region. So um, 
this is an area where, where further thought will be, will be useful as well. Um, okay, and so um, those are the two main things I wanted to talk about. And so in the final few minutes, I'm going to run very quickly through a few slides just showing what some of the other things that, that um, we've been up to. This is something that I mentioned in the ITC, ITC 10 minute talk earlier today. We've been working on some 3D modeling that, that couples line by line rate of transfer to um, uh, a general circulation model of the atmosphere. Um, and we've done just one test with it so far, again, for this hot exoplanet, which may or may not possess some, some oxygen in its atmosphere. Um, but we're kind of we're excited about this as a tool because we think that it has a number of distinct advantages over um, standard approaches. It's both more flexible and more accurate, and so we hope that this is something that is going to be able to be used for a wide variety of problems, both in, in Earth sciences and um, exoplanet research in the future. Um, Another thing that, that has been a really fun project that we've been working on recently is thinking about ways to constrain presence of liquid water on um, exoplanets. Again, it's hard to do because you don't have many observations where you're observing the, the surface directly. So one of the things we were considering here is that if you just take the solar system and you compare Earth and Venus, um, we have one planet with liquid water oceans that has only transient sulfates in its atmosphere, and another one that's completely desiccated and has a permanent sulfuric acid layer. And so the question became, at what point do you transition from this kind of regime to this one? And um, my grad student, uh, Caitlin Loftus, has been doing detailed modeling work on this, and she's managed to show that we think you can place actually very strong constraints on a water inventory based on, if, if on an exoplanet you observe SO2 in the atmosphere or a presence of a permanent haze layer, that strongly constrains the ocean inventory that our planet will have um, over a, a wide range of realistic pH values. Um, and the, the final thing I wanted to mention before moving to questions, I know this is a, like, a few different things I'm, I'm throwing at you all at once, but one more thing. Um, we've been looking at water loss from small bodies um, and posing the question if you were to move from runaway greenhouse on an Earth-like planet to a um, cometary-type body, what is the way the, the mass loss regime would change? And so um, uh, we've been looking at when you have escape occurring, as the, the planet gets smaller, its atmosphere expands, and that gives you a cooling effect. Um, and it turns out that this leads to um, a prediction of where you can have temperate regions where liquid water is still possible. And, also a lower bound beyond which, if you go any lower mass than that, you're basically in a comet-like regime where you can heat the body up. And rather than giving you surface liquid water, the, the water just escapes directly to space. And so we think that limit should occur somewhere around the, the mass of Ganymede. And this is pretty theoretical so far. We don't have any direct observations of these objects. But there have been exocomet observations from, from um, observatories like ALMA. So we have some hope in the future that this can be applied to, to things like exomoons. So we're kind of interested in pushing forward on that. OK, so that was just a few final slides. But to, to return to the, the main um, points of the talk, um, starting with early Mars, the um, weight of the geologic evidence, I would argue, suggests global warming events occurred repeatedly in episodic intervals for three to four billion years ago. Um, in my opinion, the most viable current explanation for this is intermittent releases of reducing gases into a, into a thicker CO2 atmosphere. Um, I think that the surface geochemistry is giving us strong indications, that, along with the modeling, that you have a stochastic transition from an early reducing to, to later oxidizing state. And um, based on solar system thinking about reducing versus oxidizing chemistry, we've also been working on um, coupling um, evolution processes for, for a, uh, a model to study exoplanets. Um, the main takeaway point from that model is that if you are moving to planets which are further away from the host stars, the chance of abiotic oxygen buildup goes down significantly. So if you observe O2 and ideally H2O and ideally, ideally N2, but definitely um, 
there's just the first two. <laughs> if you, it, in order of importance, I put those gases. But I think that um, the upshot is that um, combined, this would be a strong suggestion that life was present on these worlds. I need to find a way to refine that statement in the final slide. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll take any questions. With regard to that final bullet, uh, would that statement hold for ozone? Yeah, so ozone ozone's interesting because it, it um, obviously forms when you have oxygen present, but it also requires the absence of water in the region that's forming because if the water's there, it will photolyze, you get OH radicals, which would destroy it. So uh, we're currently thinking about this as a way to think about some of these cases where the cold trap of the planet weakens. So like Earth today, you have troposphere and it's the water's rained out and then you're dry in the stratosphere and that's why we see ozone there but uh, you can do simulations for example we've done photochemical calculations where it's looking at well mixed O2 H2O atmospheres and the ozone abundance becomes significantly lower when you have more H2O and so um, we're going to think about ozone next as a possible way to discriminate some of these cases as well but it's certainly in the dry atmospheres if oxygen is present, ozone should be there as well. In astronomy, some people have considered things like, um, say, habitability of white dwarfs. Not white dwarfs themselves, but planets around white dwarfs. And, you know, these, I mean, you're just doing such an amazing amount of work. There's so much understanding from so many different areas that go into this. I'm trying to you know, come away with a, a kind of a take-home message that I can uh -huh. understand. <laughs> you're, so, so you're talking in some, to some extent about the evolution of the planet, things that the planet is outgassing, the uh -huh. development of these magna oceans, and then also the environment the star <coughs> provides in terms of how much heat it, it can give at yeah. this distance. Um, do you anticipate that there could be situations where a planet is, in fact, very old, you know, maybe billions of years old, um, the star has evolved, the star is now a white dwarf, and perhaps it's close enough that it's getting, you know, adequate radiation to satisfy some flux requirement for habitability. Are there circumstances where some of the things that you're talking about could come into play? in a case like that, where the planet is, is quite old? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like your first point about this stuff being complex, I think that's, that's definitely true, and planets are complex, and the moment you start looking at solar system data in detail, you realize how many things need to be taken into account. And so the challenge in moving from the solar system to exoplanets is stripping out the stuff which is not essential and keeping only the things that are. And so um, the uh, I'll, I'll say about white dwarfs in just a second, but I think one point I would add about this kind of modeling is that we are coupling a lot of processes together. I think it's necessary in order to make the statements that we make about oxygen and planetary atmospheres, but I really think the observational validation of the models is, is critical. And so to me, thinking about the, the hotter planets which are not in the habitable zone and how our models can be constrained by their observations is one of the most interesting aspects of this right now because that will be, allow us to refine our model but also make suggestions for people studying mantle petrology and things like that when there's like uncertain parameters in aspects of these equations we can say this is a critical parameter of what we're doing this needs to be refined better and by doing so we can we can build up a more integrated picture but to, to, ask, to answer your second question about white dwarfs and age of planets um, yeah, the stellar, the stellar environment always matters, so you, you have to think about that for the atmospheric evolution. The main thing that comes into account when thinking about planet age is if it's old enough and for, for the interior to have cooled enough for things like plate tectonics to shut down, then that puts you into a very different regime from what the Earth's in. And so to me, that would be the sort of the first order of consideration for, for thinking about um, that kind of regime, although you would want to think about the stellar environment more as well. Do M stars uh, have enough UV to effectively make ozone and stress? They have decreased UV, that's a good point. So um, you need to incorporate that in any photochemical model to see the rate at which it would build up. 
Um, it varies from M star to M star, but um, I'll have to think about it. I mean, you could just do the basic Chapman chemistry calculation where you have, like, you integrate and get your dissociation coefficient and compare them. It could be wrong. I seem to remember being a root dependence. But like, but the hell it is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good point. I'm just curious how you model the production or manufacture of water as a function of distance from the star and stuff like that. Production on the planet or delivery to? Yeah, I mean, the basic manufacture of the water. We treat it as a free parameter, I think. Is the, so <laughs> this, is, this is something I treat. So the, the, way, the way that we have chose this axis for water is that um, if it's stochastic delivery, we don't know what it's going to be. But it could be from zero all the way up to the point where at about a few percent, we're going to be able to tell if the planet is volatile rich, just looking at this mass radius relationship. So I don't think, uh, from first principles, we can constrain water inventory currently. I was going to ask a similar question, but <clears throat> do you think that the delivery of water uh, to Earth, let me change the question slightly, has had a significant role for cometary impact? And if that were the means to solve the water source on Mars, presumably it would be less. And yet all this yeah. very convincing hydration. So yeah, with Mars... Something else is going on. I mean, the challenge with Mars is not just having water there, because we have... We have sufficient water even on Mars today to do the the erosion. It's about getting it liquid, so yeah. it's a thermal problem more than a um, supply problem. And Mars, you can look at Mars's deuterium to hydrogen ratio, and it looks like it's lost significant amounts of water over time. So there's maybe seven to ten times more in the past than there is now. Um, cometary supply could easily be a part of that. Um, Earth's D2H is more like the chondritic value, and so. Um, people still, there's still debate about it, but that's a suggestion that you have pantry embryos that are forming further out and then impacting in the late stages of formation. Uh, with that, uh, let's uh, thank our